Welcome to the Progressive Women's Leadership Podcast, where our mission is to advance the women's leadership movement in a way that is empowering, supportive, and bold. My name is Mike Brown, and I will be your host. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's podcast of Progressive Women's Leadership, and we are a pleasure to have our guest, Pamela Jett, a leadership and communication skills expert. I've personally worked with Pamela for years, five, six, seven years. She's trained thousands of women leaders across the U.S., and we're excited to talk to her today about the three keys for better self-talk during emotional charge situations. So, Pamela, how are you? I'm well. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to share some information today. Thanks for asking. Excellent. Now, you personally had some fun recently. You're doing a little <laughs> traveling. I, uh, it sounds amazing. I've been really pri- privileged. One of the benefits of being a professional speaker is that I travel the world and have the opportunity to speak and work with others. And I also accumulate an awful lot of frequent flyer miles, which I on occasion use for my own advantage. And I had a fabulous trip to the Swiss Alps and went hiking and spent some time working on a new book and really enjoyed myself immensely. I, I think the world's an amazing place and I love to visit and see new places and do new things. And I never hiked the Swiss Swiss Alps before, so it was a first for me. Well, you are truly living the dream, the Swiss Alps. <laughs> I, well, I don't know about that. I don't know about that, but it was it was a good time. <laughs> right. Well, before we jump in, I just wanted to give everyone um, one more resource, and if anyone is looking for more information on the types of things we're talking about today, you can go to PamelaJet.com, and there are tons of resources for you to check out that information. So let's jump into it. Now, we talk about emotionally charged situations and emotional control. Let's talk about emotional control a little bit. Why does emotional control matter in the workplace? Well, I think everybody's had the experience of saying something that they regret or something that they give their eye teeth that they could somehow take back or have a do-over. And often when we find ourselves in emotionally charged situations, situations where emotions are running high and things are tense, that's when we tend to make some of those errors, when we tend to kind of lose our cool, so to speak. And then we say a lot of things that can do some pretty hefty damage to our reputations, to our credibility. And for some of us, it also, we don't like the way we feel when we behave that way. We wish that we had had better self-control and that we didn't behave that way, whether it's at work or at home. Those emotionally charged situations can really trigger a whole lot of regret in terms of what we say and how we say it. So what are, what are some examples that you've seen or heard about in the workplace where people go down those paths? Well, a lot of times, especially for people in management or leadership level positions, they'll snap at their employees or they'll be belittling or demeaning to those that work with them or for them. So an employee might come up with a solution to a problem and instead of saying, oh, that's interesting, they might just, oh, that's not going to work. And you can just almost hear the frustration or people will easily take the bait And by that I mean when somebody else is behaving inappropriately and maybe yelling or being disrespectful, it's very easy for professionals to sometimes go down that road themselves and kind of take the bait, so to speak, or get hooked. And that can lead, of course, to some career (laughs) setbacks or even massive HR woes, depending on the severity of losing one's temper or losing one's cool. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to, you've written about it in particular for women, how would you describe it? Is it different for women than it is for men? I'm not sure if the answer is that the situations are different for women or for men. One of the things that I have discovered about women as I have worked with women leaders around the globe is that Many of us, and not all of us by any stretch of the imagination, but many of us still suffer from a bit of that nice girl syndrome or that people pleasing syndrome. We, we want to be nice and we want to be helpful. And so in the workplace, sometimes we wind up, shall I say, 
keeping some of the things that we want to say held back. And so we hold on and we hold on and we hold on. And then we sometimes, when emotions run slightly high, we can snap because we've been holding on to some of these things that, well, we would have liked to have said, but we don't say them because we want to be a good girl. So that's something that can be difficult for women. I also know that women sometimes will have a harder time containing their outward displays of emotion like tears, not so much because women are more upset than men are, but many women have been socialized that tears are an acceptable form of anger expression. I know that sounds unusual, but a lot of women will cry when they're angry. They get so frustrated because they don't know how to express their anger, but they'll cry. And often it is socially acceptable for a woman to cry, at least more socially acceptable for a woman to cry than for a woman to yell. So what happens is in the workplace, sometimes women can get so frustrated because they don't know how to handle it assertively, and then they wind up uh, being prone to tears or other inappropriate emotional displays, which of course aren't good for anyone, whether we're male or female. So I think men and women both can struggle, but those are some of the things that I often hear from my clients. Like, Pamela, I want to be able to use my good communication tools, but I get so upset. I, I, I start to cry or I get all choked up or I get so emotionally spinning in my head that I can't even put two words together. And I think it happens to both men and women. It seems, though, that women are also more willing to admit that it happens to them. Men don't always want to admit that they get emotionally upset uh, until it's very obvious that they're emotionally hooked or upset by some of their behaviors. So I want to dig a little deeper there with tears in the workplace. What is your take on tears in the workplace? Is it acceptable? When is it acceptable? What are your thoughts on that? I, I Personally, I don't think it's a good idea to cry in the workplace under um, the vast majority of circumstances. There's always the exception that proves the rule. And it, obviously, if tragedy happens in the workplace and tears happen, there's some different social ramifications to that event. But in general, in the normal stream of business activities, tears are typically not very positive or accepted. And so it's in our best interest as professionals, be we male or female for that matter, to learn how to manage the intensity of emotion so that it doesn't come out in tears. And when it does, to even know how to manage that. Like if we find ourselves in tears, how do we handle that appropriately? Because sometimes we're at that point of no return. It's like I am crying and now I need to do some repair. And that can even be something that's worth discussing like how do you recover once the tears have started to flow that's a great point i've um personally um been in meetings where i've had folks cry multiple times and um you know people find to recover in different ways and i guess it's different for every person is it something you should go with is something you should apologize for is it something i mean what are your thoughts there well, my number one piece of advice when, when it, when tears are inevitable, when you've done everything you can to gain internal emotional control and it's not been as successful as you would like and you wind up in tears, I think it's important to recognize first and foremost that the tears aren't bad or wrong. It's simply that it sends a message to those around you that you are no longer in that rational place, that you're in an emotional place and it makes it more difficult for them to connect and communicate and move business objectives forward. That's why it's so important to not let the tears flow. However, if they do, my number one piece of advice, especially to women, is to talk through the tears. And I don't mean to be blubbering. I mean, if you start to cry, you can say, you know, just a moment, I'll compose myself. However, I do want to make sure that I add and then continue to contribute to the conversation and if you feel so inclined, you can say, I'll, I'll be composed in a moment. But I would not say I'm sorry. I would not say I apologize. I would simply so ex- – I might excuse myself. I might say, oh, excuse me, I'll, I'll have more composure in a moment. I might choose to do that. But typically, I'm not even going to draw attention to those tears. My goal would be everybody knows I'm crying. Everybody knows that I know I'm crying. I'm going to continue to talk as rationally as possible as I can, even when the tears are flowing. Because here's what that says. That says that, hey, I might be in tears, but I'm also capable of rational thought. 
and I don't become dismissed as someone who, oh, there she goes again on a crying jag. If I'm crying, I'm going to do my very best to also continue to contribute to the conversation or talk through the tears because it sends a message that even if I am crying, I'm still capable of being rational. And it also increases the likelihood that my tears will stop sooner. I think it's a great topic. I think it's something that people, it happens in the workplace. People don't talk about it enough. And um, I don't think there's one right way to handle it, but you um, you definitely express some some good solutions and some um, good approaches to, to to go at it. And the goal, I believe, in those kinds of situations is to convey the message that, you know, while I may have lost some emotional control, I haven't lost it completely. And, and that's the ultimate goal. And then, of course, the better solution is to be able to manage our internal state more effectively so that it doesn't result in these outward manifestations, whether they're tears or yelling or any other sort of overt emotional display that is counterproductive to achieving our goals and objectives at work. Because obviously, not all emotional displays are counterproductive, but many of them are, and tears would be one of them that can be considered counterproductive. So the goal is to get control on the inside first, if at all possible. Brings us to our next point, which is about self-talk. And in your in your writing, um, you know, you talk about self-talk as a big way to enhance emotional control. What does self-talk mean to you? <laughs> well, it's that voice that's inside our heads. And we all, the research says that we all talk to ourselves all day long, nonstop. And the average person talks to themselves at a rate of 600 to 800 words per minute. It's a lot of jabber jabber that's going on in our heads. So it's that voice in your head and sometimes that voice serves us really well and sometimes that voice does us a disservice. It all depends on the stories that we're telling ourselves then the history that we have and the trigger events that we might be experiencing. But self-talk itself happens nonstop, constantly. And of course, we tend to believe the things that we say when we talk to ourselves because we have real no, no motivation to lie. So it could be very, it's a very powerful tool if we can learn to leverage it and to take charge there first. It's interesting. And so when you talk about self talk, you, there are, you write about a little bit, there's a lot of science that's out there. So there's neuroscience out there, and, and I'm, I'm interested to hear a little bit more about that. Well, uh, the latest neuroscience research is really helping us to understand the power of self-talk and how we can, by making some changes, some intentional changes to how we talk to ourselves, the way we talk to ourselves matters. And we want to be able to talk to ourselves in a way that helps to create the positive behaviors and that's what neuroscience teaches us is how to leverage that self-talk to get the results that we're looking for. So when you say positive, can you give examples of something that would not be positive and another way to say it so it would be positive? Well, there are three keys to effective self-talk and at least broadly speaking, there are three keys to making your self-talk work for you or to leverage it. And the first key is to make sure that your self-talk is in the positive, not the negative, or it's the desired behavior as opposed to the undesired behavior. For example, Instead of saying in an emotionally charged situation where you might be tempted to cry, instead of saying, I am not upset. So you hear the word not in front of upset or, you know, I am not sad or I am not frustrated or I'm not irritated. When we say I am not followed by the undesired behavior, you know, I'm not upset, I'm not angry. Our brain does not process the not. It, it, in fact, one of the real common exercises people are often asked to do in workshops is they'll be asked to not think of a pink elephant. 
Like, do not think of a pink elephant. And of course, what has immediately popped into your brain most likely has been a pink elephant. When we tell our people not to think of something, they automatically think of it. It's just how it happens. So same thing with our own internal self-talk. If I tell myself I am not angry, what my brain registers is angry. And that does not help me. So I need to look for the positive behavior. What do I want to be instead? I am calm. I am patient. I am rational. I am professional. You know, whatever anchor words seem to reinforce your desired behavior in that moment, that's what you say. That's the positive behavior. I am calm as opposed to I am not upset. And, and a lot of people don't know this, so they try to talk to themselves and sell themselves down, and they'll say, okay, I'm not angry, I'm not angry, I'm not angry, and here's what your brain hears, angry, 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 which doesn't do any good. Now, well, first of all, I'm going to be thinking about pink elephants for the rest of the day. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> now, do you, do you recommend, do you suggest that, so if I'm in that state or someone's in that state, that they actually say the words in their head. So I'm in a meeting. I'm emotional. Absolutely. Intentionally. You're in a meeting and your st- and your heart rate is increasing and you feel your tummy tighten up and you may even start to flush or blush or get the, what I call flop sweat, you know, kind of break out in a sweat. Absolutely. You intentionally say to yourself, I am calm. And it's hard to imagine in that moment doing that, but your body will respond if you plant that seed in your head. But notice, it needs to be the desired behavior. And it also has to have a second criteria. And I I believe we talked about that, or we have discussed that in the past, you and I, and that's to be uh, present tense. So when you're when you're having that conversation with yourself, you want to be present tense as well as the desire to the positive behavior. So when I'm when I'm being, I want to take it one step before that though. So I know if I recognize that I'm in that state, um, then I I know that I can I can start to talk like that. Mm-hmm. Cool, because you're already talking to yourself. You're already thinking, why did they say that? Why were they so mean? I can't believe that. Oh, my gosh, I'm so frustrated. I can't believe this is happening to me. Oh, my tummy hurts. I mean, that's going on anyway. You're already talking to yourself. So what you want to do is master that and take charge of it and decide what you're going to say. I found myself at times when I am where I don't recognize. So not until after the fact in my body language and I'm stiff and I'm angry or things like that in a meeting. Mm-hmm. Do you have suggestions on how to recognize that behavior in yourself? Well, you, in, internally, there's a level of self-awareness that we all need to have. When If you're sitting there and someone has said something that's mean, rude, and nasty, and your initial thought is, oh, that hurt my feelings, and you, you're, you could want to become aware of what's going on with you internally. There's this huge school of thought around emotional intelligence, and that emotional intelligence is one of the most important skill sets any professional can be polishing. It's the emotional smarts, the people skills, the communication skills, the connectivity skills, that those are all part and parcel of someone who is emotionally intelligent. So if people struggle with recognizing what's going on with them internally, the number one thing is is to start focusing on their own levels of emotional intelligence, like get some education, get some training, do some reading in that area. Because that will help heighten your awareness. And when I teach emotional intelligence workshops, one of the things that I talk about is to learn to identify your real emotion. Like sometimes we we will even think to ourselves, oh, I'm so angry. And we're not even angry. We're confused or we are feeling left out or we are feeling overwhelmed. We don't even recognize what's going on with us emotionally. And one of the ways to help build your ability to recognize those internal emotions when they're happening is to build your emotional vocabulary. Start being very intentional with how you label your emotional state. You know, make sure that you're using the right word and build your vocabulary. Start looking at more accurate ways to label what's going on with you internally. So when you are, you might be saying to yourself, I'm so tense. Well, are you tense or are you angry or are you frustrated or are you annoyed or are you confused? 
once we can label that emotion accurately, we're typically better able to manage it. That's great guidance on the labeling. I, I can see how that would um, people would be um, caught in that cycle. I think that's excellent. And for me, I find it much more difficult for me to settle myself down using great self-talk. I find it much more difficult for me to settle myself down if I'm angry than if I'm irritated. Like I need to label that accurately because irritation is easier for me to manage than anger or frustration is often easier for me to manage than anger. I want to make sure that I'm identifying that primary emotion so that I can have a better chance of managing it effectively. Because sometimes we think we're angry, but we're really frustrated. And so we try to manage our anger, but the frustration goes unaddressed. And so no wonder it's not effective. And we still feel angry, but it's not really anger. We're feeling this frustration, but we label it anger. Right. It's a vicious, vicious cycle. It is a cycle. Where does ego fit in all of that? Oh, you know, that's, it's so interesting. I was doing a workshop yesterday with some clients and we were talking about how ego tends to really impact almost all of our leadership decisions, our communication decisions. And one of the things that, that a great leader will do, be they male or female, is be aware of their own ego and be willing to sublimate their ego or be the, so to speak, the boss of their ego. And by that I mean, Sometimes we say to ourselves, well, of course I'm angry. They yelled. I'm going to yell back. And that's our ego talking and our desire to be right as opposed to necessarily be effective. And one of the most important things that any leader can ever work on is their own ability to self-monitor. That's, by the way, that's the fancy way of saying be self-aware, like to be able to look in the mirror and say, hey, if things aren't running smoothly on my team, the common denominator, since it is my team, is me. So I need to look at my own behaviors and be willing to admit, oh, you know, there are things that I could be doing differently or perhaps I am making a mountain out of a molehill. Perhaps I'm hypersensitive to this. Perhaps I'm getting my knickers in a twist over this because of previous experiences. So I'm upset at someone and it's not because of something that they really did. It's because of something someone else did 10 years ago that has still wounded me. And it takes a tremendous amount of self-awareness to be a great leader and the great leader knows that oh sometimes my ego tries to run the show and I, and I, that's not always going to be helpful so it takes a, it takes a lot to be an extraordinary leader and one of them is awareness of ego and the role that that plays in every interaction including our willingness to settle ourselves down in emotionally charged situations instead of trying to escalate those situations so that we can win you know we kind of create that win lose environment and things can go wrong very quickly. Have you found any generalizations about how women and men deal with ego? Is there a difference? Is it the same? Are there any nuances that you that you have found? Yeah, I wish I could tell you that this is grounded in research because then I would have a whole lot more credibility. But this is, I can make some conjecture from other research findings. Uh, typically, and again, this is typical. There's always an exception that proves the rule. Anytime we start talking about gender, there's always going to be a group of people that this does not fit for. But a lot of men have been socialized to be very competitive. It's a very common socialization process. When you even look at games that little boys play, you know, they, they, it's always winner or loser. They, when they ride their bikes, there's somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. And they play baseball and basketball and somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. It's almost always a competition. So men have been often socialized to kind of view relationships and interaction as competition. Somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. When you look at how little girls are often socialized, Socialize. A lot of the games even that they play, they're very cooperation based. You know, there's no overt winner at uh, some of the games that girls play, you know, house or dollies or what have you. And what happens is, is that men learn that compete will get them ahead and often women learn that cooperate gets them ahead and there is something to be said for that socialization process and the ability to admit that you were wrong or that you made a mistake or that you 
don't know everything already. And it has been my experience that in many respects, men find it more difficult to admit that they don't know it all already. Because when you look at the world through a competition lens, then that makes them less competitive, less likely to win. Whereas women don't have as much shame historically and sociologically attached to admitting I was wrong or I don't understand this or I could use some help or and I don't know how to do this. So as a result, sometimes I think women are a bit better at keeping that ego piece in check. But notice I say sometimes and a bit because every time I say that, there's always a thought in my head of a woman that I know who her, the ego runs rampant and a man whose ego is much more balanced and is not running the show. So there's always exceptions to that. But I think from a kind of like how we're socialized a bit, I think sometimes it's easier for women to tame their ego than it might be for men because they want to win. And that's understandable. It's how we've been socialized. So you were talking about emotional intelligence and how important that is. Do you have any recommendations of resources, books, or sites that you've been to, instructors that could help others? Well, the person who is the foremost uh, thinker about emotional intelligence is Daniel Goleman, D-A-N-I-E-L, and then his last name is spelled G-O-L-E. M A N. So it's not gold. It's Goleman, G O L E M A N. And Daniel Goleman has written a tremendous number of books all on emotional intelligence and emotional intelligence at work. And it, he's the go to source for emotional intelligence, at least at this stage. And there's so many different places to look for resources. I really love uh, the work of Dr. Daniel Amen because Dr. Daniel Amen talks a lot about how the brain works and and that can help us be more emotionally intelligent. Uh, there's a fabulous book out that is written by a gentleman named Scott Halford, H A L F O R D and all of a sudden the uh, Active, that's the name of the book, Activate Your Brain. And it's about leveraging a lot of your brain power, which also is part of that emotionally intelligent process. So there's so many tools that are out there. And of course, there are webinars and there are resources, even some that you present are, have some emotional intelligence skills, because I know I've delivered many of them for you, where we've talked a lot about emotional intelligence and tools to build your emotional intelligence. I will put those in the show notes so that people can link back to them. I thought those were some great resources. I appreciate that. The next question I have is moving you back to the better self-talk. We talked about um, you. there were three ways to better self-talk. There was positive was first, and then you started talking about present tense. Yeah, that's a very important part of the self-talk as well. So the positive meaning the desired behavior. So it's I am calm, not I am not angry or what have you. And notice that I, that I, the I am is in the present tense because here's what happens. Sometimes we will be trying to settle ourselves down and we will say, okay, I will be patient. I will be patient. And the problem is when we say I will be, our brain hears, but not now, not right now, not right now. I can be as impatient as I want to be. So the key is, to keep it in the present tense. Even if at the moment you feel disingenuous or you feel like a liar, so to speak, because you're feeling hostility or frustration or anger and you say, I am calm, it, it feels very counterintuitive to say in the moment the positive behavior. But it needs to be present tense because otherwise it'll never take root. If we say, I will be or um, I want to be, it it doesn't work. We want to act as if it's already happened, and that's that's a way of fooling ourselves. And it's basically uh, comes from this the really basic psychological concept that uh, Daniel, oh, pardon me, not Daniel, uh, I think Leon Festinger talks about. And Festinger talks about something that most of us know as cognitive dissonance. So when our behavior on the outside and our internal dialogue are not consistent. We experience cognitive dissonance or some disconnect. So when the way we think and feel about something is different than the way we're behaving about it, we'll have dissonance. And human beings do not like dissonance, so we have to change something. So we want, we are either going to change our behavior or we're going to change our internal self-talk. So if I just stick with I am calm, I am calm, I am calm, I am calm, eventually I will calm down because I can't live in a state of feeling and acting not calm 
but having my internal self believe I am calm. It just doesn't work that way. So we do it in the present tense to activate the outer behaviors. It's interesting. I can see how that would be helpful. It's just, it's one of those, it's a basic psychological concept of cognitive dissonance. And it's really, it, it happens. So if I'm internally thinking I'm calm and I'm externally behaving in a not calm way, something's got to change. And if I am bound and determined to be calm, I just say, I am calm, I am calm. If I intentionally choose my self-talk, then my external behavior will change to become in alignment. Otherwise, I'm going to experience too much dissonance and that's, that just doesn't work. And then in your writing, you talk about the third key. And so it was being positive, the present tense, and then the third you write about is is calling yourself by name. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's it's funny because, Mike, I've been doing this for a long time. I have talked to myself calling myself by name almost my entire life, when especially when I'm under really tough situations. Uh, when things are really under the gun, I will often say to myself, okay, Pamela, you know, you're you're bright. You can do this. And then I have to remember, so no, not you're bright. You can do this. Okay, Pamela, you're bright. You're doing this. You've got this. You're doing it. And I will, I've literally almost my entire life have been saying, okay, Pamela, internally, like I talk to myself and call myself by name. And I always thought that was kind of a fluke. Like that was just how I tended to talk to myself. And not too long ago, I ran across some absolutely fascinating evidence that shows that when you call yourself by name, your self-talk is actually more effective. And all of this, and this is empirical evidence, not anecdotal evidence. The researcher who conducted the study, he was hearing all this anecdotal evidence about self-talk and how good it is for you. And so he wanted to kind of figure out how self-talk worked. And in the, as a part of his research, he started interviewing extremely successful people, athletes and people who have survived horrible circumstances and come out uh, stronger or with a real powerful message to share with the world. He has looked at successful business people, and he spent time talking to them and interviewing them, and he said there was this weird commonality. When they talked about their self-talk, they, they all were calling themselves by name. You know, Bob or Mike, they would talk to themselves by their own name. And he thought, that's kind of weird. This is a trend. The real successful people call themselves by name. So he dived more deeply into that. And I won't bore you with all of the details of the research study because, quite frankly, I don't recall all the details. I just recall the findings, which are call yourself by name. It's going to make it stickier in your brain. And that resonated for me because I have been doing it naturally. And now I'm trying to do it even more intentionally to call myself by name. It's almost as if it's like someone else saying it to you and it has more resonance in that situation. Kind of helps you get outside yourself and say something that you will actually listen to because it's coming from outside yourself. It's very odd, but it's one of those things that many people do naturally and have had to render success and now the science backs it up that that's the way to do it. Just call yourself by name. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you're, you know, you hear and you read a lot about when you're interacting with others to call folks by their name people love to hear their name i mean it's mm-hmm. one of the one of the things so if you're doing it yourself i can see if you get into that habit that pattern i can see how it would have that impact and it's consistent if you that's the key is to be consistent with it of course and you'll see the results from my perspective calling myself by my first name may sound really hokey but nobody hears it anyway except for me so why not why not stack the deck in my favor and use everything i can when i talk to myself to uh increase the likelihood that my outward behavior will be in alignment with my desired behavior. You know, so instead of being angry, I'm calm. I want to tell myself, Pamela, you're calm. You are calm. So it's present tense. It's desired behavior, and I'm calling myself by name. And it increases the likelihood that I'll behave that way, which can be a key to success in all sorts of emotionally charged situations, even disciplinary conversations. You know, leaders who have to have those tough conversations with people can get themselves all worked up. And instead of getting worked up, say to yourself, you know, Susan, you are professional. Susan, you've got this. You know, if the, obviously if your name is Susan. So you call yourself by name, present tense, and the desired behavior for all sorts of situations, even as a preventative measure before you get upset to just kind of remind yourself that you're not going to allow this to be upsetting to you. Well, some great advice you've given everyone here. Um, you know, the keys to better self-talk during emotionally charged situations. I'm pretty positive that folks who have uh, listened to this will, will get a lot out of it. 
And um, before we jump, though, I wanted to ask one question of you. And I, I mean, you have done, you are super productive. Every time I talk to you, you're you're <laughs> doing, writing another book or you're updating this or you're on another project. Or you're training more people or you're helping others to be more productive. So the question. Mikey, are you calling me a workaholic? <laughs> I'd say you're productive, not a workaholic. I know, but I'm just going to give me a hard time. <laughs> the one question I have for you, and I think it would be great, is what does your first 30 minutes of the day look like? So for the women leader out there trying to be more productive, and, and I, I like to ask a lot of people this question, what does your first 30 minutes look like? So my before I answer, do you mean the first 30 minutes when I wake up or the first 30 minutes when I hit work mode, like when I'm in the office? Which which one? I, I would like to do the 30 minutes when you wake up, like how you get yourself. Oh, yeah. I'm one of those, um, well, centering people. I wake up in the morning and the most important thing for me to do is to express gratitude and set my intentions for the day. So I'm not one of those people who bounds out of bed with a bucket load of energy. I'm a bit of a slow waker upper. And as so as part of that stretching and getting myself ready to hop in my gym clothes if I'm here in in home or if I'm on the road with clients, sometimes ready to start my day with them, which sometimes means I get to go to the gym and sometimes it means I go immediately into, uh, say, a keynote speaking slot or something along those lines. I... I typically just lay in bed and express gratitude. I tend to express gratitude through prayer. A lot, some people will meditate or just simply list the things that they're happy about as a, a reminder to themselves. And then I to kind of focus on my intentions for the day and the, what I want to accomplish and how I want to feel that day. And then I'll let you in on a secret. And this is something that I've often told a lot of people. I have something on my ceiling. You know how we have the, we've been talking about self-talk. The self-talk is also a form of self-affirmations. That's what sometimes they're called. Well, what I have done is I have a theme, and this is how I function. I typically have a theme for the year, and it's in alignment with my business plan, and my business plan also reflects some personal things as well because I tend to be very holistic in my lifestyle So, in terms of like whole life. And by that, I mean I don't think of my work life and my personal life. Those things are just holistic. They're integrated together. So I have a theme for the year and I have a business plan. And so what I have in my, the reason that's important is in alignment with all of those big picture things, my theme for the year, I have some affirmations that are my I am statements. And they are, and oh, this is the embarrassing part, they are posted on my ceiling. So when I wake up in the morning, it is the first thing I see and it reminds me to set my intention in that direction that day. And I change them up every once in a while because after a while I get used to seeing them. For example, the one that I have right now, I need to pull down and put up something new because I'm no longer seeing it. I'm so used to it being there. I need to change it up. And uh, it's, to me, a great way to set myself up for success during the day. So I express gratitude and set my intentions. And using those affirmations on my ceiling have helped. And people laugh, but... That's okay. It works for me. I think it's great. <laughs> well, I'll tell you a funny story. I mean, the first time I did it, it really, it was, um, I was married at the time and <laughs> it was just a little shocking to my poor spouse. He woke up and was like, what? <laughs> and he saw, and it wasn't true. That was what was so funny. It was like, it was, I was projecting intention. It wasn't something that I had a, an earning goal and it was so I had, I make, and there was a number and he looked at that and he's like, that is not true. And I said, it will be. Like it will be. So <laughs> he wasn't quite sure what to make of it. And when I've gotten used to people having strange reactions to it, painters came in to paint my home and they saw it on the ceiling. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I better tear those down. But they thought it was kind of cool. They're like, that's kind of cool. So I, I've had mixed mixed reactions. But for me, it works. It's a nice phys- physical reminder. And then, of course, I walk into my office and my office has my vision board on it. On it so I see it all the time. I that's I, I'm really visual. So I need those visual cues. Well, the thing that I, I, I enjoy about it is it's intentional. Yes. And so you, you, the reason that you're so productive and you get so much done is not by chance. It's intentional. It is totally by choice. And I, and if I could give any piece of advice to a woman out there who is looking to take, or a man for that matter, but for women in particular, since that's who our target audience is here today, It is to spend some time, and it does not matter when you choose to do it. It's really nice to do it when the calendar turns to a new year because there's something 
natural about that. But I think sometimes we forget if we are employed by someone, how we can still have a strategic plan. I have a strategic plan. Every year I put together my strategic plan and it has these major areas of my life, business and personal, and I have a strategic plan and then I have goals that are set in alignment with that strategic plan and action items that I'm going to take. And what I have found really helpful is when I get off course, I have to go back and I have to say, is that part of my strategic plan? Is that really in alignment with what I said I wanted to accomplish this year? And sometimes Sometimes the answer is yes, it is. Sometimes the answer is no. So then I ask myself, is that the best use of my time, effort, and energy? Or do I need to change my strategic plan because this thing is so fabulous, I don't want to give it up, whatever it may be. And I think sometimes when we are business owners, it's easy to look at it that way. And it's harder to look at it that way when you're an employee. But you want to have a career by choice, not by chance. And set yourself up for success. Like what, where do you want to be a year from now in your career? Well, create a strategic plan to have it happen and check yourself and see how on target are you. And so those are all things that are very intentional for me. So my day to day activity is very much in alignment with those things that I set out for myself. And well, I fall off the wagon like everybody does on occasion, but try to jump back on and refocus. And it helps me spend my money wiser, my time wiser, and also gives me permission to treat certain things as important, not because anybody else has said they're important, but because I have decided they're important for me and for my happiness and success. Very good guidance. <laughs> I just kind of got on a soapbox there. I apologize, but it's I feel very passionate about it. <laughs> no need for an apology. It was excellent. Well, are there any closing remarks you'd like to share? Well, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to share our guidelines for better self-talk, especially for emotionally charged situations. And I would encourage everyone who's listening to obviously practice them because nobody has to know you're doing it. It's something that happens internally. Uh, You know, feel free to call yourself names preferably your own name. Uh, That would be helpful. And I believe that you'll find more success in staying calm, cool, and collected, even in emotionally charged situations. The key isn't what do you know? The key is what you're doing with it. So make a commitment to yourself to practice these things. And if you want to take my concept of uh, the calling yourself by name and affirmations and stick it up on your ceiling as a nice reminder. If you're, if you find yourself getting upset a lot, maybe that's your affirmation to remind yourself of every morning, you know, uh, Pamela, I'm calm or Pamela, you're calm. And you could see that and focus on that for the day. So to kind of integrate some of the things we've been talking about. Great stuff. And again, you can find more information about Pamela and all the things that she's writing about at PamelaJet.com. And I want to thank everyone for joining us on the Progressive Women's Leadership Podcast. And hope you have a great day, week, month, and enjoy. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the podcast. For more information like this, please go to progressivewomensleadership.com. Thank you.